Welcome to the future and you. Ideas and opinion about the future based on verifiable facts of today. This episode is for September 4, 2013. I am your host, Stephen Ewan Cobb. One of the legends of science fiction passed away a few days ago on September 2, 2013. Frederick Pohl has been a book and magazine editor as well as a poet, critic, literary agent, and teacher, but he is probably best known for writing the classic science fiction novel Gateway, which not only kicked off his series of novels about the Heechee, but also won him the Nebula Award, the Hugo Award, the John W. Campbell Award, and the Locus Award. I had the pleasure of interviewing Frederick Pohl back in 2010, shortly after he had turned 90 years old. In memory of his life and work, Today's show contains that interview, which I had originally divided into two parts, but for this episode, the two halves are combined into one. In today's interview, Frederick Pohl talks about his co-founding of the Futurians, how he was excluded from attending the very first Worldcon, predicting the future using the Delphi method, his contribution to democracy in Moscow, the Americanization of the world. He has traveled to more than 50 different nations. His nonfiction books, The Way the Future Was, Our Angry Earth, and Science as a Spectator Sport, and a few insights about his long-term friends Isaac Asimov and Donald A. Walheim, the creator of DAW Books. And now, on to our interview, which was recorded on January 30, 2010. Here is Frederick Pohl. Well, of course, the obvious thing is that uh, since you were born in 1919, You've witnessed a good bit of history that others have only heard or read about. Yeah, so I did. The Depression and World War II in particular. When you think back, what is it that stands out most to you? Um, well, the fact that I think there were these immense events going on, like the World War II and the Depression and various other odds and ends, but uh, they didn't really impact on my life a great deal. It stayed pretty much the same from year to year, no matter what was going on. In the war, of course, I got into the service. I was sent overseas with, into Italy with the Air Force for a while, and that was all interesting. But uh, I was still interested in the same things I had been, namely writing and reading and uh, a little bit of history. And the fact that the whole planet was in an uproar didn't seem to change my concerns. Mm -hmm. I'm curious, since you're, uh, of course, most known for being a science fiction writer, and I also noticed that you, uh, you've spoke and taught about future studies, I'm wondering how much of your science fiction is what you actually expect to see in the future, and how much of it was made up more because it was good for the story? All of it is made up. Science fiction is not a very good way of predicting the future. In fact, there isn't any very good way of predicting the future. The future studies thing was a vogue uh, 40 years ago or so, and uh, there were a lot of think tanks in the country with, funded by government and industry and all sorts of... Uh, institutions that wanted to learn more about the future, and they devised many ways of trying to predict what was going to happen, none of which worked. The thing is, it's not possible to predict the future. What is possible is to invent it. If you make up your mind what you would like to see happen, you can work toward making it happen. If you try to think what will happen, you have to take into consideration so many variables so many influences that can change it that you never are going to get it right. Hmm. Um, have you seen any examples in the past that uh, people have, uh, or nations or organizations, have worked to specific uh, outcomes and succeeded in it? Well, um, there are specific goals that a large number of people are working towards now, such as trying to reduce the damage the human race does to the environment. Uh, how successful they are, I don't know, because it's not uh, possible. That's not a source of profit for enough people, and uh, there's therefore not enough effort put into it. Mm -hmm. One of the books that you wrote is called Our Angry Earth. Yeah. 
How would you describe that? Well, that was an attempt to show some of the things that were going on in the world that were doing tremendous perspective damage. And in fact, they did all keep on going on and they have done damage, such as uh, the raising of the world's global average temperature, which is famously responsible for killing off polar bears. Mm -hmm. And then... uh, The trouble with trying to influence the future is that so many people have a stake in not doing it. Uh, Large industries and wealthy people in general like things the way they are. So it's hard to get enough people who have the necessary muscle to get together and act on it. Mm -hmm. What What is your greatest worry about the future? But we're not going to destroy the environment. Mm -hmm. Uh, The world temperature is predicted to rise by a certain number of degrees uh, over the next 50 years. The number varies from source to source, but they all, almost everyone agrees that it's going to rise, which is going to mean that uh, polar ices are going to melt and the glaciers in the world are all melting now. And all of this additional water will raise the sea level somewhere between one or two meters and as much as 30 meters. If it's one or two meters, it's just going to be trouble for countries like Bangladesh and uh, some of the Asian island countries. And if it gets to be 10 or more meters, it's going to mean they'll have seen the last of New York and uh, Venice and probably London and a lot of other major cities because mm-hmm. they'll be under the water. The flip side, though, of the question is, what is uh, your greatest hope for the future? My greatest hope is that somebody like our present president will inspire enough people to act for the good of the world rather than for their personal enrichment uh, to avert some of the worst things that will happen. But he's not succeeding very well at doing it, so I don't know. The title of your autobiography is The the Way the Future Was. Yeah. Why did you come up with that title? Has vision changed so much? Well, it sort of describes what I was trying to write. I was, science fiction I was writing years ago, and the science fiction I'm writing now, were about possible futures uh, as I saw them at the time. And then the world kept changing on me in the future possible futures began to look different every year. So it, the, the science fiction that was written when I began reading it was all about giant machines and spaceships that went not only to other planets but to other stars and all sorts of things that human beings would do by controlling the environment mm-hmm. and by succeeding in making things happen Uh, regardless of the consequences to the environment. That no longer seems reasonable. The environment wins all the time. Mm. So uh, I think that uh, the futures that we saw then are not going to happen, and a whole different set of of futures are more probable now. But as I say, that's a uh, sucker's game, trying to predict what is going to happen it's possible to rule out some things that can't happen. It's not possible to say what will. So no matter how much effort really is put into it, they're always going to miss the mark. Oh, yeah. So some of the uh, techniques for future predicting that were developed in the 50s and 60s were really pretty good. Some of the think tanks, like uh, Rand Corporation, invented whole procedures. One was called... Um, um, I remember one called the Delphi method. Delphi, Delphi was one of the better ones, and that was the Rand Corporation thing. Oh, okay. And it really was very impressive. Mm-hmm. Uh, they tested it in ways that uh, made sense, and using Delphi pre- procedures to see if you could identify a fact that you didn't know. Mm-hmm. Uh, one of the tricks was to predict what they... What page before or after, how many, how many pages before or after the middle 
with the name Miller appear in the telephone books for seven or eight different cities. Mm. And it really worked quite well. Huh. How about it didn't work well afterwards predicting the future? Yeah. <laughs> as, as time passed, some of the predictions were in periods that became present, mm-hmm. and they were all wrong. Mm. Well, I remember I used to read a magazine called Next back in the 80s. Yeah, yeah. And that's where I learned about the Delphi Method. And one of their predictions that they made based on the Delphi Method was that the first country in the world that would use a nuclear war, uh, weapon would be in a conflict between India and Pakistan, but they weren't sure exactly which one would use it. They figured more likely Pakistan. But uh, we haven't seen that yet. Well, uh, that's a sensible prediction. It doesn't mean that it's anywhere near likely to be right. Yeah. The yeah. sensible part of it is that the Pakistani government is a lot more ill-controlled than the Indian. Yeah. So you never know what they're going to do there. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it was interesting to me, though, that they made that prediction in the middle of the 80s. Yeah. Yeah, well, if Pakistan was poorly uh, governed then and has not got better. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. Let me ask you about a different book you wrote. Sure. This one uh, confuses me just a little bit. It's called Chasing Science, and it says that it's uh, on the uses of science as a spectator sport. And I'm wondering what that means. It means that the science is fun. The subject matter of the book is things, places you can go and things you can see that are interesting and scientific. Oh, okay. And it involves uh, things like observatories and laboratories and think tanks and uh, also things like geysers and volcanoes and all that sort of thing, which are scientific events that are going on before your very, very eyes. And I've always found that sort of thing very pleasurable. Mm-hmm. Iceland is one of my favorite places because there's so much going on there. It's um, on the border between two tectonic plates. And uh, there is a valley in Iceland which marks the demarcation between the Atlantic plate and the European plate. And it's opening slowly. Mm. Uh, not not to the naked eye, but if you come back, if you make, if you measure the width of the valley now and come back in five years, you see that it's a little wider. And it's interesting that that valley occurred because it became the place where the Icelandic people had their first of any human parliament. Oh. And one of the reasons was that it was a valley, and the speakers in the parliament would speak from the top of the cliffs of the valley to the audience below. And the reason for that was that if anybody wanted to come after them with a sword, they could get the hell out of there fast. (laughs) I see, okay. Yeah, apparently we may maybe they need that in the British Parliament. (laughs) Yeah. But the Icelandic Parliament was the first in any nation in the world. Oh, okay, okay. Yeah, when uh, when I was reading about it being a spectator, science as a spectator sport, the only thing I could think of was those uh, TV battle robot shows. Oh, yeah. All kinds of interesting stuff. Mm-hmm. It's, uh, I've been to see a number of uh, satellite launches and things like that, and they're always fun. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. Another book, uh, and all I've read is just a little blurb of it, it's called Practical Politics. Yeah. How to manual for the American political process? Is it? Uh, I mean, is this a book somebody could pick up and and then run for office from it? Well, yes and no. Uh, it's, it's sort of out of date now. Things have changed. Mm-hmm. But when it was published, people did in fact pick it up and use it to run for office, mm. including the son of a friend of mine in Moscow, who decided to run for the Moscow City Council. <laughs> and didn't know how to run a political campaign. Mm-hmm. because this was the first election they ever really had, and nobody knew how. Hmm. So he took my book, and he did what it said, and he got elected. <laughs> oh, excellent. He retired not long after that, mm-hmm. and I've sort of lost touch with him. I don't know what he's doing now, but he was a member of, it's not called the city council, but that's what it is, for two years at least. 
I was talking to Gregory Benford, a friend of yours, a few weeks ago. He told me recently that you have traveled to a total of 50 different nations. I think it's closer to 60. Mm. I haven't added them up lately. Mm -hmm. But uh, yes, I, I like to travel, and my wife likes to travel, and we've been able to do it. What I've been doing for the last few years has been traveling on a cruise ship because I don't really like getting in a plane and sitting in an airplane seat for eight hours or more. But the cruise ship is wonderful because I can uh, see what's going on uh, without having to get up and do much. Uh, I particularly like river cruises. We did one of those a year, a couple of years ago over the uh, Danube, and I really enjoyed that. However, I am now mostly in a wheelchair, so I don't do much traveling at all the last year or so. Oh, okay, okay. I was curious, though, since you have traveled, and I'm presuming it's not something recent. You've been doing it, I imagine, for decades. No, all my life. Well, okay. mm -hmm. uh, actually, my first long-distance trip uh, began when I was six weeks old. I was born in Brooklyn, New York, mm -hmm. but my father had a job in Tamon. So when I was six weeks old, we got on the ship and headed for the canal zone. Mm. Do you have any memories of it? I have no memories of it. I have photographs, but no memories. Oh, okay, okay. A few years ago, my wife and I took a cruise through the canal, and so just so I could see what it looked like, because I had no memory of it at all. But I've done a lot of traveling since then. There's about uh, 10 or 15 years in my life when I, well, 10 years in my life when I hardly ventured out of Brooklyn, mm -hmm. but uh, then the war came along and I began traveling again. Oh, I see. Having traveled so much, I'm wondering, you've seen the changes that have gone on around the world. What are some of the some of the biggest changes that you've noticed in the way the, the world situation, so to speak, is, other than that there's not a world war going on? I mean... Uh... I think it's the Americanization of the world. Mm -hmm. Wherever I go now, I, any city I've been in in the last uh, 10 years, Looks mm -hmm. more and more like New York or Chicago. Mm -hmm. Same sort of uh, high-rise buildings and the same sort of transportation. They all almost all have subways now, and uh, it's. I think it's the um, Americanization of the world. I think every country in the world is trying to be physically more and more like the United States. Uh, their that, their institutions don't change very rapidly, but their physical appearance is the same. I've I've been in places like uh, uh, Korea, South Korea, and uh, other parts of Asia, and been in hotels that are absolutely identical to the sharpest and newest ones in New York. Also, you see you see McDonald's everywhere. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah, yeah. So I was talking to um, Alan Dean Foster one time. He travels a lot. Yeah. To obscure places in, in many cases. And he says that he can be in uh, Borneo and he sees somebody wearing a grass skirt and a, and a, uh, a rock and roll T-shirt from some band. <laughs> I believe it. <laughs> yeah. I've never been in Borneo, but it sounds very plausible to me. Mm -hmm. For people that, uh, that don't travel, say, or that at least don't travel out of America, are there things that they might not be aware of at all that they might have misconceptions about? Well, Americans have uh, a myth of America, that it's the most democratic and progressive place in the world, and uh, maybe it was at one time, but it's not anymore, and they, most Americans who don't travel are not aware of the fact that Americans are not loved the way they used to be. Mm. And there was a time when uh, I felt pretty safe going anywhere in any country in the world, because Everybody liked Americans. Mm -hmm. I don't believe I know that's not true anymore. Mm -hmm. But uh, in places like Italy, where there were strong radical movements to, aimed at destroying the government and everything else, mm -hmm. I, I would go around any part of Rome or Italy or Naples or even Naples and feel quite secure as long as I was known to be an American. I don't feel that now in any country except most of the United States anymore. Hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, my impression is that people around the world still want to come to America. 
Oh, definitely. That's that's a question of uh, money. Is the, the money is better in America than almost anywhere. Mm-hmm. The jobs are, are they're in bad shape right now, but by and large they're easier to get here than anywhere else in most of the time of the last century. Oh, okay. So it's not just, I mean, I was going to go for it. It's not that they like us, they want to live here, but it's also not that the they want the lifestyle of here. It's the money, it's the jobs. It's the job and the fact that they can do things for themselves and their kids that they can't do in many other places. I see, I see. When you were young, let's see now, uh, about a month before your 10th birthday, the stock market crashed, kicking off the Great Depression. I have no memory of that at all. Okay. Well, I what remember I was... the Depression. I don't remember the stock market. Okay. That was kind of what I was going for. Since you spent your teenage years in uh, a wor- pretty much the worst economy uh, that this nation has ever saw, yeah. that I'm, at least that I'm aware of, I was wondering if it had an effect on you as far as your, your, your view concerning money or your view concerning anything. It has had a – well, it has had some effect. I'm not sure I can describe it. Uh, when in the worst of the depression, my family was in really bad shape. There were times when we had no place to live, and my parents would uh, find some place, and they put me with one of the relatives for a few days. Uh, and I remember that uh, with great pain; the way it worried me. But uh, there was nothing I could do about it, mm-hmm. and uh, they managed to get me through the worst period somehow or other. But there were long periods when we didn't have much money. I've heard that some people who went through that, it made them uh, save more and not invest in anything with any risk like the stock market and stuff. Um, I have had bad luck with the stock market, so I have been out of it basically for years, many years now. But... uh, I mean, what I, I I would occasionally get stock one way or another, inherited, or sometimes it was given to me for in lieu of money for a, a lecture tour or something like that, and it always went down. So I I have felt that I don't know enough about the stock market to invest any money in it, but uh, I'm not sure that the, the these are consequences of living through depressions. I think they're just the consequence of the fact that I think gambling is a dangerous thing to do. And the stock market is gambling. Mm-hmm. Something else that happened when you were a teenager, you co-founded the Futurians. Yes, yes. How did that get started and uh, and who else was involved? Well, we're, you know, what happened was there was a man named Hugo Gernsback who started a thing called the Science Fiction League as an attempt to sell more copies of the magazine he was publishing. And that made it possible for people who read science fiction to get in touch with each other and to found little local clubs. And once they got started, there was no stopping them. There were clubs all over the place. And uh, science fiction fans herded together I suppose partly because uh, we were regarded as freaks by the rest of the world, so it was like being cellar Christians, and we were hiding from what the the real (laughs) world did, Mm -hmm. because we wanted to talk about science fiction in the future and other planets and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. So the fans became a big part of my life. I was writing something the other day, and, uh, and I found myself writing that uh, of all my long-term friends, every one of them I had learned, had met through science fiction. The ones I met through other sources, like school or church or neighborhood or whatever, were friends for a time, and then I'd move away, or they'd move away and lose touch with them and forget them. But some of my science fiction fan friends have been friends for many, many years. There are two, one in uh, New York State and one in uh, Florida, who have been friends of mine for 73 years. Mm, wow. And, uh, and I met them through science fiction. Mm-hmm. Mm. Uh, all of my long-term friends, I recently reached through science fiction. 
Hmm. I suppose science fiction is a community that you've never left, so to speak. No, I've always been uh, part of it in spirit, if not in essence, because um, during the war I was in Italy and I didn't have much to do with science fiction. Apart from that, I've been involved in science fiction as a writer or editor or fan or hanger-on uh, all my life. Mm -hmm. A name that cropped up when I was reading about the Futurians was Donald Wolheim. Yeah. He's a, apparently a major figure in the first half of the 1900s as far as science fiction goes, but I was not really familiar with him. Uh, if you would, for people who are not familiar with him, would you, uh, would you talk about him just a little bit, his work? Donald was a fan like me. Uh, he was one of the co-founders of the Futurians. There were four or five of us who did it. Uh, and he wasn't much of a writer, but what he was good at was organizing publishers. And he... I, I was I became an editor when I was 19, and Donald became one about a, so a year later. He was a little older than I, so he was maybe 21 or 22. And uh, he stayed in the publishing business. He was the editor for uh, Ace Books, which was a large paperback book firm at one time. I still is, I guess, but uh, under completely different management. And uh, he left them to start his own company, which is called Daw Books, uh, D-A-W for Donald A. Wilhelm. And that has been going now for about 20, 25, maybe more than that, years. Donald died a few years ago, but his daughters were still running it. And it's one of the principal science fiction publishing companies. Yeah, I only associated him with Daw. I didn't realize that uh, he was... Uh the organizer of one of the very first science fiction conventions, probably the verse. Absolutely. Yeah. Well, the very first science fiction convention ever was Donald's idea. He, he suggested that a few of us in New York get on the train and go down to Philadelphia and meet with the fans there and call ourselves a convention, which we did. And that was such a, an intriguing idea to fans that uh, two months later some people in England had one and then they were all, all over the place. Mm hmm. Yeah. So apparently it was a it was a ripe for the times, so to speak. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Donald was very uh, he was very inventive and very very smart, and he invented the first world con too. Except that uh, we lost control of it and we were thrown out of it. <laughs> okay. <laughs> it was uh, his his idea was that New York City was about to have a world's fair, and there would be people coming from all over. And some of them would be science fiction fans, so we would find a way of getting the fans together and have a world convention, mm -hmm. which is exactly what happened. But as I say, uh, not all of them, I and three or four others, were excluded from it. Mm -hmm. From from the very first one, though? Very first world con, yes. Really? I was just about to ask you how did the first one go, but if, if you weren't there... Well, it, it wasn't much of a con. It lasted for one afternoon in New York. Mm -hmm. Oh, okay. Uh, and had a few writers for speakers, and mm -hmm. that's about it. Okay. They've become much, much more elaborate and time-consuming since then. The world cons now, there's one every year, and it's in a different country every year. It's been in Japan and, and uh, Germany and France and... Italy and, and everywhere. Yeah, I've been to a World Fantasy Con, but I haven't been to a World Con yet. Well, the World Fantasy Con, uh, they got the idea from the World Con, so it's very, very like a World Con. Another friend of yours was Isaac Asimov. Yeah, a long-time friend. How did you first meet him? As a fan, he, like everybody else, uh, was reading Wonder Stories, and he saw some stuff about this thing called the Science Fiction League. So he joined up and went to a meeting, and from then on he was hooked. Wasn't he up in Boston, though? It was like kind of no, he was in Brooklyn at that time. His parents owned a candy store near Prospect Park. Oh, yeah, okay, okay, yeah. Um, he, uh, he had a reputation for being a little quirky and a little bit uh, flirty sometimes. Did he ever... Uh... No, Isaac was a, was a very friendly unpretentious guy considering he had an IQ of God knows what mm. and knew everything. <laughs> but uh, there are, I've, I've known a lot of high IQ people who are quirky and worse than that. Mm. But Isaac wasn't one of them. 
Okay. When I was in high school, I read, I don't know, four or five of his books that were just full of just nothing but essays. Yeah. Brilliant, brilliant stuff. Yeah, he wrote on everything. Yeah. yeah. I've been meaning to get a copy of his book on the Bible because uh, mm-hmm. there's a radio program on the Bible that annoys me and I want to check some of their facts. <laughs> yeah, I've got a copy of it. It's uh, it's brilliant stuff. I haven't read the whole thing. That one, yeah, I read the whole thing too years ago, but I didn't buy a copy. Ah, okay, okay. Arthur C. Clarke was a friend of yours. Yes. How did you guys get together? Uh, the same way everybody else did. He was a fan in England, and uh, he, at some point during World War II, he uh, had a little spare time, so he wrote a science fiction story and sent it off, and they bought it, and he became a science fiction writer. He was, at that time, in the RAF. Forget what he was doing. Something... Uh, I think he was an engineer, wasn't he? I'm not sure what it was. I think he was working on radio or something. In well, he was working on radar, but I don't know if he was actually working on it himself mm. or merely oh. an officer of a detachment that was working on it. Oh, okay, okay. He, uh, he uh, signed up for some books uh, years ago and discovered he couldn't write them. Mm. So he asked some of his friends to finish them for him, mm-hmm. and I finished one that uh, came out just before he died. Yeah, I wanted to ask you about that. Uh, that's I've got that in my notes. I don't see it right here. But uh, if you would, talk a little bit about that. There was a, an idea called the uh, last theorem. Mm-hmm. The theorem is a term for an argument in mathematics. And uh, he wrote me you know, we were in sort of constant, not constant, occasional text by letter and had phone call. In one of his letters, he mentioned he was looking for a collaborator to finish that for him. And I took that for a hint, so I volunteered, and he said, just fine. So he sent me his notes, such as they were, and uh, I was a little depressed to find out how skimpy they were. Mm. But I figured I could ask him questions, so I did ask him some questions about some of the things in the notes. And he wrote back to say uh, he was sorry, but... If he had known what he meant by that at one time, it was long gone. He had no recollection of any of it. So I was kind of on my own on that book. Mm -hmm. And he he was quite ill. Uh, What we worked out was that I would write drafts, and he would check them over and tell me what he thought and make suggestions. And that worked pretty well for the first few thousand words. But then he began getting sicker and sicker, and toward the end he couldn't even read what I had written. Oh, okay. Mm. So I'm afraid that a lot of the last part of the book is very little Arthur and quite a lot of me. Oh, okay. Are you pretty pleased with the work, though? I think it worked out right, yeah. I was concerned that uh, you know, I was doing it all on my own because Arthur couldn't read it anymore. And uh, the editor was a man I'd never known before for uh, Delray Books, which is a branch of I forget, and they've all eaten each other up, and I forget which company owns which. So I didn't know him, and I didn't get any feedback from him. And when I finished the book and sent him the last chapter, I was really worried, because I said, hey, this guy may, may hate it all, and what am I going to do then? <laughs> mm-hmm. And then about, it took him about a month to respond, and then he wrote a letter saying, this book is the first to Closest to a masterpiece of any book I've ever read. Mm. I think I would feel better. Excellent, excellent. Well, I never doubted that your ability to. I mean, you've what? You've won practically every award. In fact, I think every award, the uh, major science fiction award. I've uh, won most of them. Yeah. <laughs> I'm just about to be nominated for the best fan writer because mm. uh, I've been publishing a blog which is eligible for fan magazine and you know, competition. I just oh. discovered yesterday. Okay, okay. Anyway, I'm being nominated for it. Excellent. Congratulations. Yeah. Yeah. I want to take you back a little bit farther, though. Yeah. When you started writing, you, when you first started, uh, you wrote entirely under pseudonyms, a lot of different ones. Why did you do that? Because <laughs> I was a teenager and not very smart. <laughs> I thought it was romantic to write under pseudonyms. I began getting published uh, after a fashion when I was 17. And I was rather naive. The first thing I sold was a poem to Amazing Stories in 1937. 
and uh, I was under a pen name. I had nothing under my own name until I was about 22, I think. And as a consequence, I am able to ignore some of those really lousy early <laughs> stories of mine, um, which I'm, I'm very glad about. <laughs> I think you're being a bit modest, probably. Let's see. From 1939 to 43, you were editor of two pulp magazines, Astonishing yes. uh, Stories and Super Science Stories. Right. How did you get that job, and what, what was the most difficult thing about it? Well, I was interested in uh, either writing or editing, and in order to uh, find some way of working myself into it, I spent a lot of time with editors. I had decided to be a literary agent, so I was taking stories around to them and talking to them. I got to be fairly friendly with a few of them. And I wasn't selling them anything as an agent because the stories were pretty bad, but they were mostly friendly. And one of them somehow or other gave me a pretext for asking if, asking him if he would like to hire me as an assistant. And he said he couldn't do that because he had no budget for it. But uh, Harry Steger, the publisher of Popular Publications, has, had just announced that he was going to bring out a whole bunch of new magazines, and why didn't I go talk to him and ask if he would like me to do a science fiction magazine for him? Mm-hmm. So I did, and uh, to my astonishment, he gave me the job. It wasn't much of a job. I think my first pay was $10 a week, which even in 1939 was uh, poor pay. Mm. Mm-hmm. But um, I discovered shortly after that what what he and most other publishers of pulp magazines at the time expected writers to do mm-hmm. was to write the stories for themselves so they could supplement their pay with stories for stories they wrote for mm-hmm. stories, yeah. Mm. So um, it was possible to make a living at it. And I did that for several years, and then the war came along, and I had, was taken off to Italy. Mm-hmm. This uh, this might sound like a naive question, but it, by being an editor, did you did it improve your writing or did it allow? Oh, you definitely. To... I think I learned more as an editor and later on as an agent than I ever learned from any book on writing. Mm. Uh, yeah. It's wonderful to see what other people do wrong. And as an editor, I had manuscripts coming in that I could see needed something done to them. Because anyone should be able to see that. And it was possible to see how to fix some of them, to learn what to do to avoid problems. And I am confident that I would be nowhere near as competent a writer as I am now if I hadn't spent so much time as an editor and an agent. I'm wondering also if um, if writers, because they're kind of isolated very often... Um... Yes, if they are focusing on the wrong things in their stories sometimes that they they don't have the they don't have the right perspective in what to present most strongly in the story sometimes they do writers uh, there have been a number of cases when i suggested to a writer that to something they could be doing would be better than what they were doing and sometimes it worked out quite well uh, larry niven uh, is a very successful writer I published his first several stories, and I gave him advice on what to do. Mm-hmm. And uh, I saw that there were certain things he was very good at and suggested to him that he concentrate on those things. And uh, uh, one of the things I suggested to him won him his first Hugo Award. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I used to read a lot of his stuff when I was in my 20s. He's a good writer. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. What is it you most that you remember most fondly from that particular time period? Oh, I remember the whole pleasure of editing a magazine, finding writers, getting them to do things that you wanted to do, publishing stories that uh, otherwise might never be seen. Be seen. And uh, it was like, uh, uh, like being a 12-year-old boy with a brand-new train set <laughs> and having fun playing with it. Mm, mm-hmm. Back then, you, uh, what, as far as your own writing, you collaborated with a lot of writers. Yeah, I've always enjoyed that. About half of my novels, almost half of my novels are collaborations. 
I'm wondering how that worked as far as the mechanics of it. Did one person write an outline and the other one write the well, story? It was, no, it was different with each writer. With Cyril Cornbluth, uh, my first collaborator, first major collaborator, uh, we did, I think, eight books together. Cyril would come out to where I lived in New Jersey at the time, and we'd have dinner and a drink or two and sit around and talk about what we wanted to do, what kind of characters we were interested in, what problems we should have, and so on. And then when we'd sort of worked out enough to begin writing, we'd flip a coin and one of us would lose and go up to the third floor where we got my office and another one for Cyril, which is our back writer in bed and all of that. And uh, whoever lost would do the first four pages <laughs> and come down at the end of page four and say to the other one, you're wrong. Mm -hmm. We would go up and write the next four pages mm. without any discussion of what's going, what was going to be on them. And that worked very well with Cyril and not with anybody else. Hmm. Uh, we'd grown up together. We'd both been Futurians, and we were interested in the same sorts of things. And so it was also a, almost a species of telepathy that went on. I could see where he was going, and he could see where I was going. Hmm. And sometimes he would have an idea, and I would flesh it out, and sometimes I would have an idea, and he would flesh it out. I don't know if you've read any of those books, but uh, I can point to some specifics in some of them which worked out when I had a rough idea and he made it, made it sing. And that, that's what we were able to do. What would be an example of a, of a good example of the title of one of those? title of one of the uh, Well, in the, the book called The Space Merchant, which was oh, okay. our first and I guess our greatest success, mm -hmm. uh, mm. there is a point where uh, the poor people in the human race are being fed with um, there was a man named Alexis Carell who had who was a biochemist, biochemist and he had developed a bunch of muscles from a chicken heart which kept on growing forever mm. he would cut pieces off it and they would grow more and more and we assumed for the purposes of the story that you could do this on a large scale and just chop off pieces and therefore give chicken to everybody who came by. Mm -hmm. and, and that was my suggestion that we do an Alexis Corral chicken art sort of thing. Cyril turned it into a secret passage. In the interior of the chicken heart was a revolutionary organization headquarters, and it just got to be beautiful the way he did it. Mm. Mm -hmm. Another magazine that you were editor of was Galaxy and If. Yeah. Um, yeah. I remember Galaxy, but I've never read If magazine. Well, if was sort of the uh, poor sister of Galaxy. Uh, it paid less for writers and, and uh, was somewhat smaller. And so Galaxy was the, at one time, the class of the field. And it was a title which was taken over by other magazines uh, long before I got out of it. John Campbell and Astounding was really running the field for most of those years. But Galaxy was first edited by a man named Horace Gold, who was a brilliant editor and a terrible pain in the neck. Mm. Uh, if, he, if you had worked for him, he would be on the phone for hours on end, arguing with you about what you were writing. <laughs> and then after you turned in the manuscript, it would be as likely as not that he would rewrite parts of it. But mm. he got some really good stories and made a good magazine. And he got sick and uh, couldn't do it anymore. And I was offered the job, so I was an editor of it for several years. I don't remember just how long. One of the things I noticed in the write-up, though, was that uh, Judy Lynn Del Rey was your assistant there. Judy Lynn Del Rey, who was uh, Judy Lynn something else at the time, mm -hmm. uh, was a graduate of NYU, whose specialty was English literature, uh, was Irish literature, and particularly uh, Ulysses and uh, all the other works of that sort. And she needed a job, so she came down and interviewed for one. We put an ad in the paper, I guess. 
as my assistant and secretary. And I figured there was a bit of a problem there. And not only because she didn't know anything about science fiction, but I figured I could teach her all she needed to know for those purposes, but because she was a, an achondroplastic dwarf. She was about three feet tall, big head, short limbs, large torso, and so on. And brilliant woman. But I wondered how she could work in the office because I didn't see how she could reach the door top drawers in the file cabinets. Mm. But we took a chance and hired her, and she learned extraordinarily rapidly. Mm-hmm. And when I left Galaxy, she went to work for Adam Valentine Books and ultimately became the editor and publisher of Valentine Books. And she married uh, my friend Lester Del Rey. And as Judy Lynn Del Rey, she became the name that uh, they gave to the books. It became Del Rey Books. Yeah. She, she really dominated the science fiction book field for a, year, a few years there. She was a brilliant, brilliant person and learned faster than anybody else I've known. Mm. Mm-hmm. I was surprised to see that uh, that you've written for um, Playboy magazine. Yeah, not lately, but I do to write for them. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I know that they're a high-paying market, but uh, but I'm curious. Uh, do you remember what it was you submitted to them? Science fiction. Oh, was it really? Okay, <laughs> okay. They like science fiction. I was at a Playboy party. Mm-hmm. Uh, you didn't go out to Hugh Hefner's house. I forget what the occasion for the party was. Mm-hmm. And I got to talking to one of the editors, and he said uh, he liked my story that was in Galaxy. And I said, I didn't know you read Galaxy. And he said, I love it. I, I would have published uh, several of your stories if you'd sent them to me. Mm. So then I began sending stories to him, and he bought several. And, mm-hmm. and they were paying much more than the ma- than science fiction magazines were. And I began writing other things for them. Uh, I wrote... Did, Bob Ettinger uh, had sent me a manuscript about immortality through freezing, and I had uh, published it in my magazine. And then I did a lot of publicity for things like radio and television. I did the Johnny Carson show, and we talked about it. And uh, then Playboy asked me to write an article for it, so I did, and I wrote several other articles for them. Mm-hmm. So... Uh, it was one of my major sources of income for a few years there. Mm-hmm. Yeah, if I remember correctly, Playboy in the late 80s was a $2 a word market. It was a high-paying market, much more so than the magazine, science fiction magazine. Mm-hmm. It still is. I just have never, I haven't sold them anything for years. <laughs> it's a funny thing. I um, used to stop in Chicago every once in a while and visit the offices and they uh, had a new fiction editor once, and I got to talking to him, and he was being very cordial and saying he'd like to see more stories from me, and they had published several in the year before that. And uh, I, we discovered in conversation that we had known each other when we were teenagers. Mm-hmm. We were mm-hmm. both interested in amateur publishing, and there was an organization called the Amateur Press, the Press Association, and we'd both been to a meeting of it in Boston when I was, I think, 15 and he was about 17. And after that, he never bought another thing from me. <laughs> I don't know what I said to him in Boston. <laughs> Apparently, I blew my chances. <laughs> mm. You mentioned that you had been a, uh, a full-time literary agent. Yeah. I, I read in my notes that, uh, that you ended up representing more than half the successful writers in science fiction. That's true. Yeah, and that that you were Isaac Asimov's only agent. Yeah, I was, well, I was the only agent he had for the first five years or so. Mm-hmm. And uh, I did pretty well for him, too. I got, he had never published a science fiction book. And I uh, talked him into giving me the manuscript of something he'd written for a magazine and rejected it. And he didn't want to do it. Mm. And I finally twisted his arm and got it and he bought it. It was his first professional science fiction novel. Not his first professional book. He had written part of a book on biochemistry. So he had 
had about a third of a book before that. But uh, after that, he began doing very well in the books. Do you remember what that first book was? Yes, it was a novel he had written for startling stories, another science fiction book. And after they looked at it, they bounced it. Mm -hmm. And he had it lying around. And it was called Grow Old Along With Me, which is from a poem by, I don't know, I forget who. Um, and I showed it to Doubleday, and he bought it. And they changed the title to uh, Pebbles, Pebble in the Sky, mm. which is his first science fiction novel in book form published. And Doubleday went through an insane period at the time, and they would not accept anything of his that appeared in it as a science as a serial in a magazine. Mm. So he was only doing new stuff for them for a couple of years. Mm -hmm. And then they had a, a sudden attack of sanity and realized that they were losing a lot of very good books. Mm -hmm. They changed their policy, and ultimately they wound up with all of his books, all the old serials and so on. When you were, um, I'm going to say a younger younger writer, who was it you looked up to as a, as a really good writer that you kind of admired their work? Uh, different ones at different times. Among science fiction writers, the most reliable writer I knew at the time was Robert A. Heinlein, mm -hmm. who kept turning them out in great volume, and they were all good. Uh, later on, he reached a point where he could, if he wrote a manuscript, they would publish it, and if he didn't want to change it, they would publish it unchanged. And a lot of his books published toward the end of his life needed an editor and didn't get one. Oh, okay. And it was a pity because it could have been much better books. Mm -hmm. I also liked uh, a number of, well, H.C. Wells, I thought, was the father of us all. Mm -hmm. uh, and I tried to uh, imagine what was going through his mind when he invented concepts like time machines and so on. Mm. I don't know how successful I was at mimicking Will's mind, but I did think I wanted to be H.G. Wells. Mm. And uh, Ted Sturgeon was a very period there, one of the best writers around. And I thought, I don't know if you've ever run anything by him, but for a period in the early 50s, I guess it was, it seemed to me that the only reason any editor bought anything from me or any other writer was because Ted couldn't write everything. <laughs> And then he sort of went down the and stopped writing. Um, anyway, the, those are science fiction writers. There's the other kinds of writers. I think my exemplar was the best kind of writing is Mark Twain. And I've tried to get that simplicity of style as much as I can, but nobody can do it like Samuel Clemens said. Mm -hmm. Another surprise that I discovered, for a while you were the official authority for the Encyclopedia Britannica on the subject of the Roman Emperor Tiberius. <laughs> yes, indeed. How did you get into that? <laughs> well, in uh, Ian Valentine's early days as a publisher, he and I were good friends, and he would publish almost anything that I wanted to write for him. And I had a habit of uh, getting interested in subjects it didn't have a book, and then considering whether I wanted to write a book on the subject. And I was interested in Roman history, and I had books about every one of the first dozen Caesars, except Tiberius. Mm -hmm. So I thought, well, I'll write a book about Tiberius, and I did, and Ian published it. And then when the Britannica wanted to revise their uh, entry on Tiberius, they had to come to the only living author of a book on it, which was me. Mm -hmm. So uh, I had published the book under a pen name, and I told them I would be glad to do it, but I was actually a science fiction writer, and my name was Frederick Pohl. Mm -hmm. And the editor, whose name I've forgotten, wrote back and said, that's fine, you can use your own name. We would like you to do it. And we discussed uh, what I would do and so on. So I wrote the entry for them. And then uh, three or four years ago, they were bringing out a new edition, and they called me up and asked if I would like to do a, an updating of the article. And I said, this is stuff that happened 2,000 years ago, and as far as I know, nothing has changed. <laughs> yeah, there's no late-breaking stuff. Anyway, I didn't want to do a lot of 
reading documents about what people were writing about Roman history at this time. So I said, no thanks, have somebody else do it. And I think, I don't know if they did or not. Uh, I know they didn't withdraw the article that I wrote, it's still there, but it may have been altered now, I don't know. Mm-hmm. Well, I appreciate you taking the time for the interview. I'm curious, before I let you go, is there any uh, new books coming out that I need to specifically mention? Um, there is. There are two books that are of interest. Mm-hmm. One is not by me. It's a, an anthology my wife published, and it's a uh, it's a festurist book. It's for me and at the age of ninety, mm-hmm. and it, I think it's about eighteen writers have written stories for it and written comments about me, and they they. Are, they turn my head, actually. They're very flattering. <laughs> okay. What's and a, that will be out in, I believe, June. What the, What's the title? It's called Gateways. Ah. I have a novel called Gateway, and Betty decided to call this one mm-hmm. Gateways. Yeah. Yeah, I've read I've read Gateway. It was a good book. Yeah, I enjoyed it. Yeah. I was probably too young to understand all of it, but uh, <laughs> it, was too, it was a good book. Well, that's one thing about science fiction. People read it young, and then they begin to understand a lot. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. And you said there was another book that I might should... Oh, I have a novel coming out, too. I haven't finished writing it, though. But that should be out in uh, the early fall of this year. Mm -hmm. And uh, I'm not sure what the title will be. At the moment, it's called Under the Mountain, but I don't like the title. Okay. And I'm going to change it, but I want to finish writing it first and see what I think. Yeah, yeah, okay. Yeah, but I can can mention that you're working on one that'll be out later. Yeah, it will be out from Tor in uh, September of this year. Okay, okay. Well, once again, I sure appreciate you taking the time for the interview. You're very welcome. Thank you. That was Frederick Pohl, recorded on January 30, 2010. You can learn more about him at his website, frederickpohl.com, or even more by doing a search of his name, Frederick Pohl, which is spelled F-R-E-D-E-R-I-K-P-O-H-L. That's it for this episode of The Future and You. This program is licensed under the Creative Commons Attribution Non-Commercial No Derivative Works 2.5 license. A copy of this license may be viewed at creativecommons.org. Briefly, this means you may, indeed you are encouraged to, copy this entire program as many times as you wish and give it away to as many people as you wish. But you may not copy only a portion of this program, you may not charge anyone any amount of money for it, and you may not use any portion of it to make something new. On the other hand, anyone whose obvious goal is to recommend the show to others automatically gets special dispensation. Offline reviews, which include the show's website, may include brief quotes. And online reviews, such as for a blog or community group or web page, which provide a conspicuous link to the show's website, may use as many quotes as they wish up to and including a transcript of one half of any interview. The show's theme music is a blues number called Some Sympathy by Chris Jurgensen and is from his album Big Bad Sun, which is available at magnatune.com. Magnatune is an independent record label that sells its catalog of music through online downloads and print-on-demand CDs. The company allows artists to retain full rights to their music and splits equally with an artist all the revenue from the sale of their work. All the music at Magnatune may be previewed free of charge, and customers can even choose how much they want to pay for the music, with pricing ranging from $5 to $18 per album. You can learn more about them at magnatune.com. That's spelled M-A-G-N-A-T-U-N-E dot com. If you have a theory or opinion about what the future will contain, be it the near future or the far future, you may email it to me at thefutureandyou.com. That's M-E at symbol thefutureandyou.com. You may also suggest topics that you would like to hear discussed or send contact information for experts that you feel might provide valuable insights into the future. Mind you, an expert is not necessarily someone with an impressive degree. The best experts are the people who live or work or strive in the area under discussion. If the subject is science or medicine or academia, a degree is important. But if the discussion concerns trends in construction or firefighting or video gaming, a degree is pretty much meaningless. 
to get the inside dope, you've got to find the people who actually do this stuff every day. They are the first to see the trends, because the trends have already begun changing their lives. As to the topics we will explore in the next episode of The Future and You, I can make no guarantees. Interviews are still being sought, recorded, and edited. All I can promise is that we will ruminate on the future. To learn more, check the show's website at thefutureandyou.com. If you enjoyed the program, please mention it to a friend, and be sure to join me again next time. Until then, I have been your host, Stephen Ewan Cobb. On behalf of myself and all my guests, I thank you for listening.